Big MOOCs, uh, Deep Learning and Smart Strategy is the uh, title for this uh, presentation, uh, first presented at the People in Aid uh, Learning and Development Network on the 13th of March 2014 in London to a group of uh, learning leaders, learning and development managers from 16 different organizations. So. Um, this was an afternoon's worth of discussion with uh, actually three discussions for one afternoon. So first part of the discussion is really about scaling up and doing more, referring to the European uh, MOOC Stakeholders Summit. The second part of the discussion is about going deep and wide and specifically you know, referring to case studies, sort of bringing that scaling up, bringing that strategic approach to learning to life using star smart educational technology. Um, basically giving concrete examples of what can be done with educational technology that's simply not possible and or realistic or feasible or cost effective any other way. And the third point, the third part of the discussion, or the third discussion really, because uh, each one of these would warrant a, a sort of fuller, broader um, debate um, and inquiry is over strategy. So really doing better and making, looking at how to make the learning function strategic within the context of humanitarian and development organizations. So how and why you do that will be the topic of this third part of the discussion. So just a few words about LSI. So this is Learning Strategies International. First of all, the mission, uh, I, I describe it as solving wicked learning problems. So what's a wicked learning problem? It's a complex learning problem. It's a problem that at first glance looks unsolvable. Like you cannot possibly do this. Let's let's just throw our arms up in the air. Um, and we think some of these wicked learning problems can be tackled today uh, through a combination of, of a few things. So first of all, sort of talent network. So that's the first thing that is LSI, is basically connecting learning leaders from the corporate workplace uh, learning world, from, of course, humanitarian development sector organizations that have these wicked learning problems that are that, that are sort of on the, on the front lines tackling them, and then people from academia, from research, basically just uh, learning people wherever they may be found. The second is LSI Studio. So this is actually basically the, uh, the implementing partner, if you will. So if you want to design, fundraise, and implement the project, um, LSI Studio will take that on. And basically a group of very smart individuals, uh, very smart and talented individuals with high level technical skills who can solve these problems and will bring in people. It's a flexible structure. LSI is not a company. Uh, it's a flexible structure. So we'll basically bring in and, and call on or, um, or you know, talk people into helping out uh, on, on any of these three pieces of design, fundraising or implementation. Uh, last but not least uh, is the idea of doing events. So even in this hyper-connected sort of digital world, um, the need for uh, time and place in which we're all together in a room thinking and discussing and, and looking at, uh, you know, examining ideas and just getting to know each other uh, is more actually more important than ever. So the idea is to organize a series of these learning and innovation events um, with a sort of crowning moment in January 2015, which is actually fairly soon now. Um, how do we start a discussion around learning and innovation? So I would start with, I would like to start with <laughs> actually uh, the worst predictions I have found, and this is a top 10 list, um, the worst predictions, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, about the future of technology and in some cases of learning. But um, so number 10 is uh, comes from the United States. Um, and this is a Western Union internal memo saying this telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. Um, the device is inherently of no value to us. Now, number nine is the uh, British um, response. The Americans have need of the telephone, but we have plenty of messenger boys. This is in 1876. Number eight is about the radio. You know, who would pay for a message sent to nobody in particular? Number seven is also musical. Uh, it's about the Beatles. We don't like their sound and guitar music. It's on the way out anyway. Number six is about the um, the sort of ba the basis of the industrial economy, oil. Uh, drill for oil, you're crazy. Now this is in 1859. Number five is about talkies. Who wants to hear actors talk? This is Warner Brothers in 1927. Number four is on television, an impossibility, says uh, its inventor. Number three is about the sale of foreign cars uh, in the United States. Yes, um, this is 1968. Number two is about data processing, a fact that certainly won't last out the year. 
it's 1957. And um, number one, my favorite uh, worst prediction about the future, uh, there is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. And this is Ken Olson, uh, chairman and founder of DEC, uh, Digital Equipment Corporation. I'm actually old enough to, to have sort of worked with some of the mainframes put together used by this company. And I'm sure so, some, some, some people viewing this presentation may be as well. Um, now, basically, the bottom line is that in the past, people who've tried to predict the future or figure out what about innovation is likely to stick uh, have failed miserably, and we're likely to do so as well. And I think accepting that reality is 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 one of the things that we need to do to to be able to move usefully um, in designing projects and and figuring out what we want to do next. Now, uh, I attended the um, European uh, MOOC Stakeholder Summit in uh, Lausanne, hosted by um, Switzerland's uh, answer to MIT, which is a PFL based in Lausanne, Switzerland. Um, that event brought uh, around 300 people involved in these massive open online courses in one way or another. And these, these, what I'm going to present next is based in part in sort of reflections and thinking takeaways from that, um, that very interesting event. So basically, MOOCs, um, I'd like to focus on the M in MOOCs, which is a massive component, and, and that means scale. And for the humanitarian and development sector, the question is, do we need scale? So I'd like to ask a simple question to, to, to this group of uh, learning and development managers. How many people did your organization train last year? And it turned out actually at the people in aid meeting I attended that most organizations did not know, which is significant for other reasons and warrants discussion, but that's not really the point here. The point is to ask the next question, which is how do you train one person? How do you train 10? How do you train 100? If you're currently training 10,000, what if all of a sudden you need to train 100,000 in your organization? How would you do it? And what is going to change as the traditional means of training that you've used perhaps and probably successfully in your organization for a set number of people, uh, what scales up and what doesn't? And and what are the, what are the implications of um, of scaling up training. And of course, um, the reason for looking at these questions is because in the face of growing humanitarian needs, we've identified an, and there's wide, broad consensus in the humanitarian and development sector that some of the challenges such as climate change are going to require an increased level of professionalization and just more people with the right kinds of skills. And it's un it's uncertain that the current traditional approaches to training are actually going to, to get us there. So let's talk now about Massive Open Online Courses. So this is the MOOC uh, acronym. And um, as part of the discussion is really about how we disseminate knowledge, where we disseminate it, who disseminates, who administers, who services, who teaches, and who learns. I want you to think about these questions in the context of humanitarian and development organizations. Um, so one of the questions to just get out of the way this is not an argument comparing face to face to distance learning uh, this is not asking whether online is better or worse than face to face but just to put that 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 to rest um, in 2010 there's the biggest ever uh, meta analysis comparing 20 years of research on the academic performance differences between traditional and distance learning so this is a summative meta analysis looking at all of the available research that 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 could be that was usable and that's the question is the final academic performance people who do distance learning better than those enrolled in traditional face-to-face -face programs in the last 20 years and it turns out the answer is a resounding yes so since 1981 when the educational technology was much more rudimentary distance learning results in increasingly better learning outcomes than face-to-face -face. so that that should be that should be the premise for thinking about distance learning we need to get that argument out of the way to look at the interesting stuff which is what's happening with MOOCs so you may or may not recognize these three individuals but these are three people who have been key to the uh, to the massive open online courses let's we'll start with um, Sebastian Thrun even though he's not the first to do massive open online courses he's the first to do it in a big um, Ivy League American American University, Stanford. He takes his artificial intelligence course in January 2012, which has around 200 on-campus students and puts it online and gets 150,000 people from all over the world to enroll. Now, Daphne Kohler is another Stanford professor. She's also, like Sebastian, going to leave Stanford to found a private company. It, hers is called Coursera, and today Coursera has over 6 million people registered on its site taking, uh, taking these massive online courses. 
Now, the third individual, is last but not least, is George Siemens. So he's uh, he's been most recently associated with edX, but he's one of the three Canadian professors um, who originated uh, the term Massive Open Online Course and who started practicing connectivist MOOCs. So basically MOOCs in which he was exploring, he uh, MOOCs intended to explore his theory of connectivism, which describes how learning happens in through technology, not just mediated by technology, but through technology and by making connections, uh, challenging both uh, constructivist and older learning theories as well. Uh, now, what happens if, starting in January 20, 2012 with Sebastian Thrun's uh, course is a massive amount, relatively massive amount uh, of uh, media coverage. And in November um, 2012, the New York Times decides that 2012 has been the year of the MOOC. This is, of course, in the education se sector section. Um, and most people to this day still do not know what the acronym means. More people may actually have found the learning opportunities opened up through MOOCs on Coursera, on the other... Uh, on the on edX and on the other uh, massive open online course platform. So it's not about the acronym. Now, what does this mean? What does this mean for uh, higher education? There's uh, some very heated debates about this. There's also um, yes, uh, uh, the sort of burgeoning debate within uh, humanitarian and development organizations inside the international organizations and international non-governmental and or governmental organizations. Uh, many people coming from the experience of e-learning, looking at discovering what's happening with these MOOCs. This is what we saw at the European Stakeholder Summit. Most of the IGOs and INGOs present have used and have deployed some kind of e-learning uh, system. Um, but uh, if you think back to those 10, uh, 10 worst uh, predictions, we've heard them all with respect to MOOCs. So MOOCs are inherently of no value to us, too many shortcomings, and there are plenty of shortcomings to current MOOCs. We have plenty of universities, so why would we need massive open online, a new way of delivering learning? Teach 100,000 people at the same time? You're crazy. Um, who the hell wants to learn online? And that's another one we, uh, we've, uh, we've heard. While theoretically and technically possible, um, commercially and financially, it's an impossibility. And this you hear most often expressed as MOOCs don't have a viable business model. Um, with only a few mil million people registered on their platforms, the MOOC industry is not likely to carve out a big slice of the education market. That's another one we, uh, we have heard. I can assure you that MOOCs are a fad. Um, there is no reason why anyone would want a classroom in their home. So um, no one knows and no one can, can usefully predict the outcome of what's happening of the debates and, and developments around massive open online courses. Um, to me, the only certainty we have is that it's not going to leave things unchanged. Yes. Um, now, what does a MOOC actually look like? So first of all, this is the edX platform, and edX is interesting because it's a non-profit. Um, it's been set up as a non-profit organization, unlike Udacity or Coursera. Uh, supported, of course, by founded by Harvard and MIT together, with a number of uh, with governance by a number of uh, Ivy League and other uh, universities in the uh, United States um, and partners uh, worldwide. Now, when you go to Coursera, this is this is actually the home page. What you see most prominently is the brand of the uh, of the partner universities. Uh, second, you see the courses, you see the content in a traditional sort of curriculum, um, you know, course catalog, sorry, format. So you can pick a course and you click and you register and you can actually start taking the course on the on the date when it begins since these uh, systems these MOOCs require some sort of synchronicity at least the edX and uh, the dominant platforms do um, now what can you get from uh, MOOCs and this is talking about looking at the content side so you can get fast track to the most current knowledge so if you're an expert and you want to stay an expert it's really about the know where much more than know how and the know what and uh, MOOCs could be one of the places where you get your most current knowledge second is the foundational knowledge so uh, MIT's first uh, offering was a was a basic electronics course Stanford's artificial intelligence would of course uh, with uh, Sebastian Thrun would also qualify as a foundational knowledge and the third and potentially the most interesting uh, uh, content model for for, uh, for a MOOC is the public policy debate. So this is actually more than policy debate, but the idea is you engage people in a two-way conversation in deeper, more meaningful ways than you can through 140 character tweets or other social media. Because you have an educational sort of structure and process um, to guide uh, debate and discussion. So um, that is... Yes, uh, that, that 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 is 
potentially for organizations engaged in interested in engaging with civil society with uh, with various stakeholders with policymakers and so on uh, one of the most interesting uh, aspects of what you can do with MOOCs and probably one of the most underdeveloped ones now um, inside a MOOC when you take a MOOC you have three types of interactions you have uh, teacher students or just uh, a uh, subject matter expert to learner in the in the professional working context, which is mostly a short video presentation. So basically packaging the talking heads or better, <laughs> just uh, as bite-sized learning um, that you can use to achieve mastery learning. So you can see them more than once, as many times as you need, uh, as well as interactive visualizations. So actually showing things, so kind of show and tell approach as far as that goes. And in the best of cases. The second uh, direction of interaction is from learner to subject matter expert, from, from, some from student to teacher. So there are some basic question types. There are activities, there are essays, there are labs and simulations, uh, basically various forms of formative and ultimately uh, summative assessment. And then there is the learner to learner dimension. So uh, right now, and this is probably one of the weaker weaker aspects, even though it's also an interesting one, um, they're basically discussion forums. And these are sort of hierarchical discussion forums the way we've known from since around the B early 1990s and going back to BBSs in the 80s. and um, and and then um, last but not least, uh, in terms of sort of peer interaction, peer review processes used to accelerate um, sort of feedback mechanisms and um, scale them up, but also with some very interesting pedagogical implications and, and strengths from uh, from from learners learning from each other rather than only from a from the uh, say stage on the stage or uh, or talking head in the video. Now, it, this is a um, demonstration course uh, done by edX, so people can get a feel for what, what a MOOC might uh, might uh, look like. So on the left-hand side, you've got your uh, your syllabus, your curriculum. On the right-hand side, you've got an exercise, which is interactive, which you use as video, which, uh, you know, uh, which uses this sort of show and tell. It's mastery learning for, as first envisaged by Bloom in 68, uh, and it allows students to achieve sort of to master concept before moving on to the next. And it's, you know, it's a short video interspersed with quizzes it emulates one-on-one -on -one tutoring um, and and um, has been the subject of much criticism but this is only this has been developed within the last uh, two years now this is uh, the discussion forum I was referring to. So Daphne Kohler was one of the first ones to sort of point to research or highlight sort of early find findings from Coursera showing that um, in 22 minutes on the average, uh, learners got a correct answer by asking after asking a question on a discussion forum. And that this was far faster and better and basically the only way to, to sort of find correct answers in a kind of massive uh, online education system that you could not hire enough tutors to achieve or that the cost would be would make it in, unfeasible to hire enough tutors to provide that kind of accelerated, accelerated response rate at any time of day or night. So. Discussion forums, even though they're quite frustrating for a number of reasons, from a from a usability, from a pedagogical perspective, do have these strengths that have been highlighted by MOOC providers. Now let's go back to our world and look at sort of e-learning in in international government organizations and and a few uh, international NGOs. So. These are mostly uh, UN organizations. You've also got IFRC, uh, Council of Europe, um, World Bank Institute, World Economic Forum. You can see that there's quite a bit of experience. E-learning, online learning is not something that's new to uh, you know in this world in in our world and you can see that the scale is also quite massive ifrc has over 100,000 people on their uh, on their system um, you know many organizations have over 10,000 and of course these numbers are all growing um, these systems have been around for quite a few years now with respect to MOOCs um, there are at least two known examples of organizations uh, from the humanitarian development or uh, or sector that have that have actually developed them um, a number of others are in development. I'll point to the um, World Economic Forum's uh, Forum Academy, which uh, is not deliberately not being called a uh, MOOC, even though it's uh, it's being done in partnership with edX using the uh, the Open edX platform. It's not the forum courses are not being featured on the edX platform, at least um, for now. And the focus is really on improving professional leadership and providing access to that most current knowledge. Second example is um, on Coursera. So Coursera and the World Bank have partnered uh, to produce this uh, course on climate change, which had uh, over 14,000 people enrolled, and um, which was interesting because it was 
Uh, it was structured as a four-week course, so not a university length or sort of semester long course. Uh, three to five hours per week is sort of more compatible for adult learners in a way. So more focused on sort of veering away from university type um, type uh, sort of frameworks and, and course structures to ones that are more adapted to uh, to adult learners um, and have the sort of framing. You know, you look at the informal language of the title um, that points that might might contain some interesting sort of kernels of ideas um, of what future MOOCs might look like, especially in the uh, workplace and, and professional development context and obviously in the humanitarian and development context as well. So what could be the potential value of sort of these MOOC-based approaches for a sector? If you think back about that question I asked about how we scale learning, and yes, we do need to scale learning. Once there is that recognition, then we need to, to ask the how. Um, one is by sort of opening up educational opportunities in the sector, you might find the gold nuggets who currently don't know the right people or can't access the networks that will get you the job, that will get you the recognition, that will get your, your foot in the door of our organizations. Second thing, obviously, is actually the most obvious one is just preparing more people. If you need to prepare more people, you need you need sort of mechanisms, you need learning systems that will that will be able to achieve that, uh, knowing that this will probably have to do uh, have to be done with you know shrinking or <laughs> just a constant level of resources. Third is um, you know the continual learning. This goes back to the sort of changing nature of knowledge. The need to sort of up and maintain skills. So you need to upskill. You need to maintain those skills. You need to open up dialogue with with actors. Um, you need to blend when and where sort of being knee to knee, not just face to face, because you can do that in a Skype call, but actually being knee to knee with somebody has value. And then that's perfectly compatible with this online educational technology, which is one of the reasons why it's no longer about sort of comparing face to face or the the the, the efficacy or the the cost of face-to-face -face with online. It's really looking at when each form has uh, each format has value. And last but not least, and I want to spend some time on this, is a changing nature of knowledge. So, what is VUCA? VUCA is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And uh, with some embarrassment, with some discomfort, I'm going to use a number of military examples and metaphors. So obviously, for and and relate that back to your humanitarian and development context. So the the basic premise of of the world we live in is that it's 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 a VUCA world, and that the nature of knowledge has changed. And I'd like to illustrate that by referring to the history of uh, of instructional design. So, you know, Second World War. Um, the United States uh, needed to rapidly train hundreds of thousands of military personnel. And people like um, like Ralph Tyler had sort of set the stage. People like Robert Gagné then began sort of des designing instruction and creating and standardizing methods of instructional delivery using teaching machines. And the Tuskegee Airmen were African American men who'd previously been excluded from uh, from armed services or segregated, uh, who were afforded the opportunity to to become airplane pilots. Um, in part because these this standardization, these new methods, uh, opened up access uh, to people whom it was, they were not open to before. So here you're talking about teaching procedural knowledge. Do this, do that in the right order. Um, and that was then. What are we looking at now? And we are looking at um, an aircraft carrier and flight operations at sea. And there's a group of people at the um, Naval War College Review in the summer of 1998 who published a study in which, which explored uh, a, a kind of what looked at first glance like a contradiction. The complexity of operations aboard a large modern carrier flying the latest aircraft is so great that no one on or off the ship can know the contents and sequence of every task needed to make sure the aircraft flies safely, reliably, and on schedule. In other words, nobody knows how this thing runs. <laughs> okay? Nobody can actually, there is no procedure, there is no manual that describes how to operate an aircraft carrier. It is simply too complex. Yes. Um, yet, it is a high reliability organization. This, this, despite incredibly high turnover, despite the the, uh, the sort of incredible complexity of the system, it's high reliability, but also self-designing. So if you can do this on an aircraft carrier, what it means that in, to me is that in humanitarian and development context, we're also confronted by complexity and confronted by 
you know, the lack of sort of written procedure to actually solve problems and get the job done, it is possible to, through self-design, to achieve a high reliability organization. The question is how, again, and this, I think, to, to, to sort of be able to get at that, we have to look at the changing nature of knowledge. And, you know, what happens when knowledge flows too fast for processing or interpreting? I don't think I have to explain this. It starts with our email inboxes. The fundamental change is that knowledge is a river, not a reservoir, and the process, not a product. This was highlighted, amongst others, by George Siemens, but very compellingly so in George Siemens does, as part of a descriptive framework for a learning theory called connectivism. Now, the second point is just about the half-life of knowledge. So if you think about the way we design courses or trainings, they're fairly, it's fairly static, and yet we know knowledge is dynamic, it changes all the time, and this requires understanding how long a specific piece of knowledge is going to, to last in a specific field to make sure that you select the right tools to keep content current. Now, if our current educational structures, if, if the trainings that we do in our organizations are not, it's not sort of addressing that complexity, it's not necessarily sort of achieving that high reliability, you know, it's not because we're not doing the best we can. It's because uh, logically, what you need to make people of tomorrow cannot be embedded in the educational structures of today. So you need to think about, you need to have that sort of forward thinking, you need to sort of change the mindset and the framework of training to look at learning beyond training, to be able to address the sort of deeper underlying needs uh, in terms of what needs to change about the educational structures that we used. And traditional approaches are not going to work. No classroom is large enough. No individual is smart enough. No response time is fast enough. No intervention is complete enough. No program lasts long enough. And no solution is global enough. And another, this slide also illustrates this point, And this is uh, from Robert Kelly at Carnegie Mellon University and it looks at the percentage. So he's been looking at the percentage of knowledge stored in your brain needed to do your job. So in 86, 1986, you 75% of what you needed was right there stored in your brain. In 2006, that is now down to 10%. So what that means is in your daily work, and think about, I'm sure if you, most, most of us, if we think about this, it makes sense. Most of what you do is connect with others in order to do your job, in order to get the pieces of information you need to do your job. And this means that we need to do things that are different from what we did in the, in the past. And in particular, looking at the pipes that connect various kinds of knowledges, that connect various kinds of ways of, of gaining new knowledge, of analyzing, interpreting, and making sense uh, of the patterns of new knowledge. Um, that needs to be what we should focus on because learning is less and less about recalling information and most of what people need to do cannot be learned through formal training for all of the above reasons improving the structure and quality of formal training is not going to get the job done now this is being looked at in the context of higher education also from that from that sort of um disaggregation or unbundling of education so if you look at the things that make up this is from uh, from michael that are, I believe, um, you know, the things that make up sort of education, what makes higher ed, you know, so university, um, you know, what it is, and it's a combination of things. So obviously the delivery formats and modalities, the pathways and the sequencing, the knowledge acquisition piece is one thing. But you've also got the credential of accepted value. You've also got the models of thinking of doing. And furthermore, last but not least, you've got that personal transformation that you get through higher education, which I think in some ways in our world, in the humanitarian and development context, people get that from the field right now. They don't get it from training, or rarely so. Culture of personal exploration, secured life transition, the rite of passage. The biggest rite of passage is actually that process of of going to a field and coming back, um, you know, gaining that practical experience. And it's got to do with our how-to sort of in the disaster management context or cowboy culture. Um, but it's worth looking at because if we're not doing that with the new ways in which we're trying to do things, we're not, we're going to be sort of losing pieces of um, the baby <laughs> while trying to throw out the bathwater. Now, before looking at these um, case studies, um, 
I would like to introduce these case studies about what I call deep learning. So I think deep learning is also a term used to refer to sort of machine learning or artificial intelligence that can replicate what humans do. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about evaluation, analysis, application, reflection, all those sort of higher order kinds of learning. But I, I mean it in the sense that um, in the sense of what a 21st century humanitarian needs to be able to get the job done. And if you look at what we do with training, education, and learning uh, in our organizations, you have to look at sort of what has changed in other areas and then look at what we're doing. So this is lighting 100, what, 150 years ago, let's say. This is lighting now. And this is medicine, you know, 150 years ago. Medicine now. Transportation, you know, um, the horse buggy in transportation now. Silicon Valley back then, and of course, Silicon Valley now. Communication, uh, 100, well, maybe a, more than 100 years ago. I don't know when pigeons went out of style. And this is communication now. I'm not sure how relevant square, four square is, but that's, that's another debate. Um, and this is education. You know, about a hundred years ago, this is education. This is uh, Mary Colance's uh, uh, elementary school classroom in 1983, and um, this is um, the classroom now. You know, in uh, in a sort of this is probably a high school in the United States. And this is education or training in Sri Lanka in 2006 in the humanitarian context. This is a picture from the IFRC of a food processing course in uh, Sri Lanka income generating project and you can see that same industrial age classroom that transmissive model of education that banking model as as, as um, Paulo Freire called it um, at work doesn't mean it's not good it's just a question of is it adapted to the times we live in and to the needs that we have um, in 21st century humanitarian and development context and um, Mary Colensis and Bill Cope have, have theorized this as the, the affordances of new learning and looking at what you can achieve with educational technology. And it's actually things that most good teachers have always strived to do. So for example, a good teacher will strive to give you recursive feedback as you work. The teacher will give you a sense of how you're doing, your, uh, what you need to improve. Um, to you, good teachers typically tend to allow students to uh, express themselves using whatever me the means with which they're most comfortable. So if they can use video or audio, there might be, and if there's a way to allow for that, um, then that will probably be allowed. Um, good teachers also try to get students, learners, to sort of actively make knowledge, not just passively receive it. Um, good teachers try to sort of stimulate group work and encourage people to work together, to sort of put their brains together, to solve problems, and to develop sort of practice oriented stuff knowledge you can reach for and use um, good teachers also try to get you thinking about your own thinking as you work like why are you doing this what what is it about what is, what does it mean um, and also recognizing that not everyone unlike this sort of leveling one size fits all assumption of industrial age uh, of the industrial age uh, classroom recognizing that um, different people start out in different places and have had different sort of paths and histories and that each according to their interest and need is really important. Now, the thing that most people recognize about e-learning or online learning is uh, the anywhere, anytime, that ubiquitous learning component. But the point is that if you think about the economy of effort to deploy all of these things in the learning system, um, they can be achieved uh, not just more cheaply, but more f with more effectiveness, with sort of deeper effectiveness than in any other way in previous human history. Um, by being supported by uh, learning technology and specifically you know, communication technology of the internet. Now, that doesn't mean that any online system is going to do that, but um, the medium certainly has that potential, yes, uh, to sort of maximize all of these affordances. Now, let me, let's come back down to earth and look at some, some sort of practical learning problems. So, um, you know, you, what do these affordances mean? How do they work? How do they translate in practice? <coughs> so, um, just think about whether in your organization you've had these issues. You know, you have a limited budget for 30 participants, but you know that there's 300 people to learn, who need the training or who, who need to develop the skills or competencies and so on. Second example, second learning problem, you have a strategy, but individuals in their silos think that 
And they're doing just fine. They don't need, you know, headquarters to sort of cook up a strategy or they don't see what it, how, how to implement it. Who has time for that? Third example, you need to develop case studies, but, um, you know, so you can send the communication consultant, assuming you have the budget, who will go out, talk to sort of stakeholders, people, you know, volunteers, uh, beneficiaries, uh, staff at different levels and, and sort of write up something. But it's going to be difficult to sort of access the, the full depth of the experience you're trying to document. Last but not least is a returning delegates, so can be generally and tend to be coerced into doing sort of lessons learned reports and various kinds of reporting. But who has time to read all that? You know, if you've got 20 people coming back or five people coming back, well, that's five times that much stuff, um, least of all other delegates. So I'd like to provide just two, two case studies, two sort of real world examples of uh, learning activities, learning experiences that were designed uh, in my work at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies uh, to provide sort of practical examples of how to address some of these issues. So the first one was called Red Talk Number 13, and this was a sort of online educational experience designed for the uh, Global Youth Conference. So Global Youth Conference was 155 participants who actually uh, from 90 or 92 countries who came to Vienna, Austria for three days to um, to discuss um, basically youth uh, global youth empowerment issues uh, within the Red Cross Red Crescent movement. Now, uh, what we did was um, uh, six weeks ahead of the uh, live event, we uh, invited people to enroll in what we call a short course in global youth empowerment. We said it was an opportunity to learn about global youth empowerment in the lead up to the global youth conference. And that we there would be missions, even though we weren't really sure what would be in these missions, we wanted to see whether people would go for it. And in fact, it turns out 775 people you know, signed up pretty much overnight or in the process of a couple of weeks. Now, of those 775, only 35 of them, less than 5%, were actually attending the Global Youth Conference. So that means that you know, we, we basically more than quadrupled the reach of the live event with people who were not attending it. And what did these new people get to do? For four weeks, they worked together on one sort of conference theme every week with sort of learning activities that were short and sweet, but with which many people engaged with far beyond what we expected. So for four weeks, we had you know, hundreds of people working online on the issues, compare that, put that side by side with the uh, three days, 155 people, obviously a very intense, very important moment to get all those people in the, in the conference rooms, in the workshops, discussing, thinking, getting to know each other, put that side by side with, with the same sort of process happening, but mediated through technology, me, you know, at a distance, connecting people from a, from a much broader uh, community. So an example of a mission two was thinking and learning about youth as innovative Innovators. And um, here we have, um, you know, we had a, a sort of thought-provoking question. We had sort of clearly defined learning objectives, 12 of them in all, most of them on reflection, evaluation, analysis. Uh, a few of them, such as defined innovation, were sort, of, were sort of very, you know, practical ones. We wanted things that people could latch onto, but we, we mostly wanted to encourage people to explore, to connect, to reflect, you know, on on a lot of these um, on a lot of these activities. So you you watch a 30 second video clip titled Future Innovators, and you relate what you've learned um, to the mission's theme. And uh, then you can invent a new post-2015 MDG linking youth and innovation. And that's just in one week. And people, you know, so people loved it. And not just young people. We had people of all ages, people from all countries, uh, around 20% of people not from the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, um, you know, who thought it was worth completing the mission. Even And we explicitly sort of gave, you know, argued why it was important uh, to go through these, uh, to the, through these steps, even though it was largely intended to be exploratory. We wanted people to engage with the content. Um, and what we got was people actually wrote over 150 pages of stuff around the four thematic areas of the conference. In addition to that, once a week, we would have a live learning moment. So a live learning moment was a synchronous time, one, a one hour session, which we got people from the from the um, IFRC Youth Commission and a few subject matter experts to come in 
and um, have a discussion around the week's theme, referring to some of the contributions from the uh, from the online learners and engaging with them through Facebook, Twitter, through whatever means people could sort of send questions, comments, react and so on. And people loved it because that was a moment when the global community really came together and sort of coalesced and people felt like they belonged to this global experience, global educational experience in youth empowerment. So of course, because it was an educational uh, experience, the follow-up included a post-course survey. So 88% uh, of those who responded to the survey obviously found the online learning format to be effective for their personal learning. So that validated the idea that yes, people would see this as, as learning and would these see this as something that was sort of compatible with their ways of, of, uh, of, uh, of learning. Now, um, those who worked on the learning activities improved their understanding of the conference themes. An average of 58% worked on the activities consistently. And uh, the same average agreed or strongly agreed that their understanding of the themes improved. So that was really over half of the people work consistently. That's still, you know, that's over 400 people working together for four weeks. You know, um, and again, when you look at the costs, you know, to design and implement uh, this kind of uh, this kind of initiative, um, it took an existing WordPress blog, uh, a, an email mailing list that we're all using sort of IFRC's mailing list manager, and uh, one intern to actually pull this off. You know, getting over 400 people to engage in these learning activities. So this is what we mean by scaling up, and this is what we mean by sort of the affordances, the economy of effort to achieve something like this. Put that again side by side with the requirements of a physical world conference, the numbers of people, the resource requirements, and the outcomes and impact. Um, and there's some interesting food for thought, especially because this makes it so easy to take any conference. Yes. Uh, and 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 do this sort of sort of pre-conference you know, sort of learning experience, educational experience, learning events. The name ha has to do more with the branding, but the idea is you take an educational approach to knowledge sharing, knowledge production, knowledge co-construction around an event, which gives it meaning, which gives it, which allows people to sort of anchor it in time and place. Now, second case study was the um, was the uh, fact and ERU uh, course uh, run for the IFRC. So I started this when I was still a IFRC staff. This is the emergency response units. Um, we used a, a learning environment called Scholar developed by the um, by uh, Bill Cope um, at the uh, University of Illinois. Um, and uh, Scholar is wonderful when you need to develop case studies, when you have a strategy and you want to develop people to develop implementation plans. It is based on peer review. It's an amazing way to connect local and global knowledges, so people at that, that global level with people working at, at actually all levels. And it's an amazing way to get people to evaluate, analyze, and apply knowledge. So when we deployed Scholar for the um, for the ERU, um, for the FACT and ERU learning course, um, we had four weeks, and in those four weeks, we developed 105 case studies. We had emergency operations people from 100 countries, about half of them from the Red Cross and the Red Crescent. We had 671 who enrolled, so enrollment was fully open. 591 uh, of those met the criteria, which would have sort of experience in at least one emergency operation, because the case study was to be basically describing how you learned, where, when, how, with whom, um, in the context of an emergency operation. And you also needed to, to sort of commit, you know, so three to four hours a week to uh, to to work, to do the uh, coursework, to do the writing, the reviews, and the revision process. 285 actually made it to the learning environment, so uh, figured out their login, their password, um, you know, uh, and actually started the course. So this was almost almost 50%, which is actually quite amazing for uh, for this kind of distance uh, open enrollment uh, online learning. And 37% um, uh, completed case studies. So that's 105 of the 285 who actually started the course. Now, this is over 500 pages of writing generated in four weeks. And the reason it was substantial and of surprisingly high quality is because people engaged in the process as an educational process. Uh, people engaged um, also through peer review. So through the process of writing, they were then invited to review the case studies of three others using a structured rubric to, to ensure because this was not a creative writing exercise. So you write 
your own, you draft it, you submit it, then you, you read, the, so you're already thinking about what's involved in the writing process, then you go and write, um, the, and the, the, you, you go and review uh, the writings of three others. And you learn a lot from how other people approached it. And all of a sudden, you've got these sort of crisscrossing knowledge flows between what you wrote and what other people wrote. And you get to provide inputs and comments, you know, so which you have to figure out how to formulate how you work with others in that context. And then starts the third uh, third piece of the, um, of, the, of the process, which is revision. So you receive inputs, reviews from three of your peers, which are anonymous, and you have to figure out what to do with them. You know, maybe somebody has sort of nonsense comments or somebody you know, didn't understand what you were saying, but others may be making useful suggestions. And also you've just read the, the, the case studies of at least three other people. So you're also thinking more. And then when you undertake your revision, it's more likely to generate a sort of a higher quality output through this process than by pretty much any other means. So just to give you a sense of who was in the course and what we mean, what we get when we get in terms of diversity, which is something that we struggle with in our organizations when we deploy these massive, you know, these these sort of massive learning systems. These were the countries in which applicants were deployed in their most recent emergency operations. These were the contexts in which applicants deployed in their most recent em emergency operations. So you, you can see lots of flood, obviously lots of ERU, uh, floods, earthquake, response, cyclone, tsunami, uh, typhoon, Haiti, emergency conflict. Um, applicants deployed in their most, uh, so these were the roles, coordinator, manager, officer, project, delegate, are, uh, you know, are the biggest ones, so the, most, uh, the ones that were repeated most often. And when we asked people why they wanted to take the course, um, this was not used to determine whether they could start the course or not, or, uh, or they were, whether this, they were admitted or not. Uh, people, you can see the words that come up there, experience, knowledge, working, humanitarian training, skills. Uh, those are the ones I would pick out. Obviously, people work, mentioned other things. And when it came to look time to actually formulating the titles for their case studies. So, so the only reason subtitles shows up, and it's actually the, an issue that, that came up quite prominently, is the level of computer literacy and the, uh, the difficulty in actually learning to use a, a learning system. So people couldn't figure out how to change the subtitle in their case study, which by default was titled, was, was, was subtitle. Um, so that ends up showing up in the word, cl word cloud. But you can see the other sort of words that came up most often, lots of people writing about Haiti, about earthquakes, about Pakistan, about, um, uh, but also words like change and work and response and case and study you know, um, uh, come up. So there's some interesting information there. And of course, as you sort of scale up learning, you also need to develop ways. Word clouds are an imperfect, uh, imperfect uh, way to do so, to sort of visualize what the learners are doing and telling you by engaging in the, in the process and the processes that you've set in motion. So basically, we started with learning problems. And here we see sort of learning solutions that we can either that are either explicit in the case studies so that we can, we can infer from them. Um, you know, the idea of doing a sort of pre-conference open learning sequence is is something that's easy, cheap, and incredibly powerful and compelling in terms of multiplying the the, the audience, augmenting the impact and the reach. You can use peer review to prepare implementation plans. So if you've got a strategy and you've got people in silos, using this sort of peer review based process in a learning environment uh, like Scholar. You make sure that everyone, the WhatsApp guys, if this is you know a global health strategy, for example, will be reviewing the uh, the the implementation plan of the malaria lady, you know, who will be reviewing the um, the implementation plan of the emergency health uh, person, yes, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's a very powerful way to sort of work, or, you know, get people to work and think and and do across silos. Uh, obviously, using peer review and open enrollment to develop case studies, you get quality through the peer review process. Um, open enrollment means you can find those gold nuggets. Uh, and people, you know, if, if the only 37% of the people actually finish your case studies, well, you know, you, you, you cannot fake that. You cannot, unlike uh, courses where you can sort of you can you can figure out how to pass the test or whatever. Uh, when it comes to developing knowledge, you have to put your heart and soul into it, or else you're not going to make it. And putting your heart and soul into it for humanitarians and development workers, at least, tends to you know be one of the factors, <laughs> one of the one of the determining factors, one of the determinants of uh, of uh, quality in uh, in the work that we do. Last but not least, using uh, peer review to share lessons as they are being reported is is uh, something that that 
that you can do. So uh, when you get people peer reviewing each other's stuff, obviously they're going to be engaging with the work of others. And if it's part of the educational experience, it's going to help them make their own work better. Um, it's something that you can do now. So you don't have to, as part of the writing process that they do for, the, for their reporting, for example, uh, rather than something that they have to do, they, they would be expected to do afterwards once the writing process is finished. So a few takeaways from these case studies. One is that you know with open web and open access sort of educational initiatives uh, like these, you don't need a learning management system or specialized you know fancy expansive learning software. Basically, you need the learning theory and the sort of guidance and expertise to figure out how to set the learning processes in motion and how to sort of motivate and engage people where they will be the ones you know, driving the, the driving the process. Second takeaway is you can dramatically expand the audience for events. So when you're trying to justify you know the cost of that face to face workshop, um, you know, adding an online component is not I mean it's not just complementary or it's certainly not not you know so sort of competing with it, but it, it can actually add strength in the justification for that event. Um, to go back to that Red Talk example, the knowledge production from the online community was used to inform the work of the drafting community in the uh, in the conference. Um, so directly feeding and informing that the, the processes you know that you've got in place rather than having something that's separate uh, or disconnected from them. So third takeaway is that you can multiply the reach of such events, you can magnify their impact and depth, and you can just accelerate the sort of co-construction of knowledge where people are not just doing their own reporting, but they're reporting, peer reviewing, revising, based on what they're learning as they're sort of re reading, writing, revi reviewing, and so on. And this works for case studies and implementation plans. All right. So now learning strategy. So learning strategy is you know, um, is not just how you learn, but how you make learning strategic. So I would say how you maximize learning and then how you maximize the alignment of the learning to your organization's mission. And the key question to, to, to sort of be constantly rehashing is, how is what I am doing contributing to aligned with the organization's mission, and how can I make a, how can I make the demonstration of that explicit for all involved? And I would like to suggest that thinking about learning organizations. So learning organizations sort of theories have been around for quite a while. Um, learning organizations, um, knowledge management. There's quite a few sort of strands of how we work with knowledge in organizations. Um, and humanitarian and development organizations have engaged with these sort of strands of thoughts. I'd like to refer to Watkins and Marsic's framework, um, which talk about. So the, there's two American researchers who originally wrote this book about sculpting the learning organization and, and describing it as kind of artistic process. Um, you're shaping a creative vision to fit the context using the raw materials at hand is how they, how they described it. And that is not a destination, but a journey, not a formula, but sort of key principles um, that can be tailored to your organization's unique needs. And their starting point was really the incidental nature of learning. So most of the learning occurs spontaneously and organically, they said, evolving from the work itself. Yes. Um, so what I mean, think about what that means for the formal training that we do. Yes. Uh, if actually most of the learning that matters is outside of the control of and outside of the context of those formal trainings what what does that mean for um, where we focus resources and how we how we help improve organizational learning uh, including some of these most obvious sites when you actually need to prepare people to give them the skills they'll need to do something or when you're trying to get to figure out what happened and how to make process improvements um, in terms of lessons learned and so on so you're creating structures and cultures is what it's all about where learning is continuous and ubiquitous, and this whole notion that you know, uh, you embed learning in the context of work itself. Now again, training has always been about, I'll stop my work now to go off to a two-day training. And here are these researchers in the early 1990s telling, telling us without making that explicit link that actually what matters is the incidental stuff, the informal stuff, the stuff that at uh, best we talk about as soft skills, and that we sort of, well, let it be, you know, people will sort of figure it out. Um, 
And uh, it turns out, if you want to sort of maximize that learning, then if you want to maximize those kinds of learning, what you need is for people, staff and volunteers, to be capable of self-direction, to be capable of proactivity and creativity and critical reflection. And these sound like 21st century knowledge skills. Yes, uh, these sound like the kinds of skills that will make a difference in a volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous environment uh, where you don't have a command and control structure. So this sounds like much of the work that you know, obviously in disaster management context, it's obvious, but I think in other contexts as well, including development ones, um, th we've known for a long time that it's skills that matter. But for example, with if you take something like a, a lot of the participatory approaches, working with communities, trying to sort of do, assess, do assessments, assess needs with with sort of community processes, what you get is a is a method that is supposed to be based on critical thinking, but what a bureaucracy will retain is the tools to implement it. Yes. Um, so a lot of us are, are sort of struggled and wrestled with these contradictions. We know that we want learning to be continuous, collaborative, creative, captured and codified, connected and collective, and to be about capacity building. So what, what Kins and Marcy do is... Uh, they 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 claim and on the basis of sort of accumulating evidence and statistical analysis and and validity that comes from the methods they develop and then and then the analysis of those methods uh, in the rigorous scientific framework, they say there's seven things that organizations need to do, these seven action imperatives that will actually help drive your organization towards organizational learning. And furthermore, they're going to claim and back up, that by improving organizational learning, you're improving the um, the the performance of the organization. So you no longer, you know, I don't want to jump ahead, jump ahead too much, but you no longer have to sort of prove yourself. There's a model that that sort of demonstrates this for you. So what are these seven things? You create uh, continuous learning opportunities promote inquiry and dialogue. And these are all nice things. I'm sure no, you know, nobody doesn't want to do this, but the reality and the first question to ask is to what extent are we doing it or not um, in, in each of our organizations. We can encourage collaboration and team learning, empower people toward a collective vision, connect the organization to its environments, establish systems to capture and share learning. And seven, and this one warrants a, a sort of specific discussion, provide strategic leadership for learning. So. There's, I think a really important point here is about leaders and sidekicks. And um, Watkins and Marsic have found in their research that you have leaders who are you know, primary gatekeepers of change. So if your line manager does not support the change you want to implement to, to sort of improve organizational learning, I don't think, you know, on, on, uh, uh, other than focusing your efforts on changing her mind, <laughs> yes, uh, I, the evidence says the model, you know, and the model built from it shows that they must transform themselves to model the learning process. And you've got to have sort of one or more individuals driving the vision. And I think this may be a role in which learning and development uh, managers might recognize themselves. You need the sidekick. You need the person with who knows how to sort of manage the change and who's going to sort of help bring that vision to life and sort of move people in that direction, help people move people, you know, move people in that direction. So um, the model looks like this. You've got a people level, which you've got four of the seven things. You've got the structural level. And then you've got the sort of outputs, and this is, of course, for the for the corporate or the for profit world. So increase of organization financial performance. I would substitute with just organizational performance. Um, so it's it it is useful to think about how your organization is doing on all all these things um, because of the nomological validity that's been demonstrated through the research done by Watkins and Marsic and other researchers showing that if you do these seven things, you get these two things as, as, uh, as outcomes. Yes. Um, so what I would like you to do now in the context of, uh, of, uh, of the workshop is um, to choose one of the seven imperatives and uh, you need two pieces of paper. On the first one you, you describe, you write down an action taken by your organization and uh, uh, describe sort of which action imperative it relates to 
and describe what you're actually doing. So if you've got a leadership a leadership program that you think is encouraging collaboration and team learning, then you put that down. And you pair up with a partner, you share each other's action, and then you swap uh, the imperatives. And you look at the imperative, and for example, if you get, um, you know, promote inquiry and dialogue, and you do not see anything that your organization is doing explicitly for this new imperative that you've been handed by your partner, then you write that imperative down on paper too. So the idea is you get a diagnostic of the gaps in your organization. And once you've gone through that process with one person in the workshop, you raise your hand and find a new partner. You mix, rinse, and repeat. So what um, what what the game aims uh, to do, obviously, is uh, is to get that diagnostic and also just share ideas. So you can realize that you're not starting from a blank slate. There's probably things that you're already doing, either overtly or that are happening simply out of people's sort of individual creativity and so just the need to solve specific problems that align with the model. Um, the point is, how can you make it intentional and strategic? And that's really where you then get to that next point, next part of the discussion. Once you've identified this, how do you move forward? How do you make the uh, the learning strategic? So you want to um, audit the present capacity to learn and change. Um, the individual, the group, the organization, and then the society. And you want to sort of build that learning in infrastructure, but ultimately it's going to be about the learning habits in people and sort of regularly auditing how you're doing. You need what we might call in a, in a learning context, a, you know, a sort of formative assessment. How are you doing? Now, it's about the details and uh, Watkins and Marsix say becoming a learning organization is in the details of daily life, how organizations interact with their people. Yes. Um, now, the business case is the relationship between the learning organization dimensions and the performance of the organization. And this is where this term, nomological validity, is the evidence that the structural relationships among the variables, so among the action imperatives, have been measured and tested against a variety of person settings, times, and methods. So if you do these seven things, you're likely to improve these outcomes. And that's that's what you know that that's what can sort of move things forward in discussions in, in in trying to show that this this model can be useful in in such a context but the starting point it starts with diagnosis and diagnosis is identifying you know where are, how are you doing in these different areas and um the way in which uh, Watkins and Marsic addressed this question of diagnosis, the sort of starting point, a stepping stone to uh, sculpting a learning organization is something called the DLOC, the Dimensions of Learning Organization Questionnaire. Now, the DLOC is basically, I believe it's uh, 60 questions. It's a, it's a copyrighted uh, questionnaire. It's been adapted to a number of contexts by Watkins and Marsic. And I'd like to make the, uh, I'd like to invite uh, interested organizations that are interested in, in, in you know in learning and development managers in particular that that would like to diagnose how their organizations are doing on this continuum of learning organizations on this journey um, one very simple effective thing that we could do together uh, would be to organize the admin you know to, to, to sort of to organize a DLOC, uh, Dimensions of Learning Organization Questionnaire, for a number of humanitarian and development organizations, which give us a basis for comparison, as well as for internal usage to determine what the gaps are and how to address them, which would be up to each individual organization, uh, even though there might would certainly be room there for sort of discussions between us on, on how we could work together. Um, so I'd like this, I'd like to end my presentation with this sort of proposal for action and, and for a sort of practical way in which we can take forward this discussion and explore uh, where each of our organizations is at and how uh, the kinds of things we're already doing, some of which are absolutely amazing and um, you know, and delivering results already, and also where the gaps are and where we need to uh, to, to do better, uh, probably by working together in this hyper-connected world that, that we live in. Thank you for listening. And uh, again, you'll find more information as, long, as well as the uh, recording of these presentations on uh, lsi.org. Thanks for uh, your attention. And uh, please do feel free to share your thoughts or comments um, on uh, Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Reda Satki, just my first name, last name. And my uh, email is reda at lsi.io. You can also find me on my uh, personal website, which is redasatki.me. Bye-bye.